Dear Professor Count, I am very pleased to have the opportunity to address you within the Brussels International Catholic School Yes, Yes, No, No interviews. You earned a BA from Harvard University and both MA and PhD in classical archaeology from Princeton University. You are a world-renowned archaeologist who has written multiple books and articles, has been involved at the Agora since 1966 and was the Mellon Professor at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens from 1985 to 1996. Since 1994, you are the Director of Excavations at the Athenian Agora, for which you received in 2016 at the Metropolitan Club in New York the Athens Prize by the SASCSA, where you are currently Professor of Archaeology. You are also the Savros Niarchos Foundation Professor of Classics at the Randolph Macon College, a member of the advisory board from the American School of Archaeology, and you have recently reserved the prestigious Theodore Salutos Award from the American Hellenic Council for your outstanding contribution to Hellenism. Therefore, given the nature of both your work in Greece and the United States, I am sure you are to provide international students with relevant, relevant advice with regard to their current and future studies. But before starting, let me remind you that the BICS, yes, yes, no, inter no, no interviews, are based on the concept of the Gospel of Matthew. Let your words be simply yes or no. So, I would ask you to answer my questions always by starting with either a clear yes or a clear no. Do you agree to it? Yes. As a secondary school student, my first question deals with the American university system, particularly from the perspective of an international student. Would you or would you not advise an international student to apply in the US for undergraduate classical studies instead of studying them closer to the credo of civilization that is in Europe? Yes, I, I think, yes, I would advise students to come to America to study. There are lots of opportunities, there's a tremendous amount of choice. There are 3,000 universities in America, which makes it much easier uh, in terms of uh, access to good people who do this. Almost all of them have departments of classical studies, and if you're already a European, then you have access to visiting the sites. What matters is what you learn in the classroom, uh, and the opportunities are very, very great in America, both in terms of funding and in terms of choices. Thank you very much for your answer. The Vox Populi says that degrees in classical studies and archaeology are not offering many opportunities on the future labor market. Is that true? I think not, but I look at classics differently. I think it's a useful way to get into any business or any profession. Uh, because you do Greek and Latin in college doesn't mean you're ill-equipped to do many other things in life. But even within the field, there are museum opportunities. There are increasing scientific opportunities now that we're working so much with DNA. Uh, the computer world is opening up archaeology in dozens of ways. So in fact, I would have thought the uh, opportunities are expanding rather than retracting. And the American School of Classical Studies at Athens and its programs, libraries and other facilities, as well as other similar endeavors around the world, imply a significant managerial and founding effort. I would be interested in understanding more about how, in general, Archaeological activities are founded by both the private and the public sector. Particularly, does ownership and control of excavations worldwide remain under the public hand? Yes, it does, very much so. There are strong controls both in Europe and in America for what you can do, when you can do it, how you can do it. Where we dig in Greece, uh, it's all overseen by the government. Uh, the same is true in Turkey, 
Italy and Greece. Uh, it's also true in America where the national parks uh, and control of federal land uh, is very, uh, very strict. So in terms of actual management, uh, that's true both in Europe and America. In terms of Christian antiquities, we may have two clashing ideologies, and maybe a balance is needed. On the one hand, archaeologists use scientific and methodological means to study the past. Then, items are kept in museums for access to the public or scholars, with the idea that anyone could have access to the history. Coherently, it is generally illegal to sell antiquities found after the 1960s. As it currently stands, even if you find something on your own land, it is illegal to sell it. The result, however, is often that thousands of items are stored in museum basements and away from the public eye. Therefore, on the other hand, some argue that antiquities should not be kept in storage but sold instead. In theory, this money could also be used to found archaeological activity. This means, however, that the material will no longer be accessible to the public or scholars for study. As not exposed in any museum, the general public would no longer enjoy some antiquities. In such case, however, the issue is that despite the fact that antiquities need to have official certificates, the latter are not regulated or standardized, and the trade in antiquities ends up by founding a very large black market, even treasure hunters. Now, under a cost-benefit analysis, would you say that the latter approach, that is, not giving stored some antiquities, but instead selling them right, in some cases? I think selling antiquities would be a mistake because it's very, very hard then to make the division between what should be sold and could be sold and what could be uh, not uh, and kept in the public domain. Uh, I think it's useful for, and I'm speaking now as an archaeologist, it is useful to know all the material that comes from a single site and as techniques develop over time, you may want to study the same material again and if you sold it to the general public that becomes impossible so at the same time nobody needs to own an antiquity and you're right if it's sold to somebody then it's out of the public domain if i have it in a storeroom it is still accessible as needed uh, mostly we don't put them on display simply because the public is happy to look at 100 pots not a hundred thousand pots, but the fact is they are still being maintained and protected and studied, and that's what they were recovered for. So it is a clear no. Let us now move to a question that relates to some of your specific fields of interest, notably water supply and topography in ancient Athens. Have ancient cities solutions for daily life Anything to teach to modern cities? That's a hard question to answer, yes or no, I'm sorry. Uh, I would say no, uh, because the technology is the one place where things have changed unbelievably uh, in modern times, and it's changing faster all the time. So we don't learn much. We can be impressed with what their technology managed to do without all the resources that we have available but we study antiquity more for the continuity of human endeavor and achievement, not how they did it. Again, on the relation between ancient and current times. There are often times when archaeological discoveries seem to clash with modern needs. I cite as two examples the building of the metro line to the heart of Thessaloniki and the new metro line next to and beneath the Forum in Rome. Both of these projects have been delayed 
due to the need for extensive archaeological excavations. Is it justifiable to keep hampering daily life for millions of inhabitants to improve only marginally our knowledge about antiquity? Absolutely, yes, I think that's not a problem at all. Uh, we have the same problem with fish and frogs and birds uh, preventing us from doing things that some people want to do. And to say that they're being deprived of a subway if they've never had one before, I'm not sure I understand how they're being deprived now. So I think uh, there's a middle ground. Uh, and that that's what one should pursue as a general rule of thumb uh, when it comes to modern convenience against archaeology. Archaeology almost always loses, so I would just as soon have the pendulum swing the other way. Uh, a final question, always in the relation between antiquity and modernity. Matters like how leaders have emerged, social inequalities grown, demographic changes developed, environmental emergencies occurred, are all bread and butter for archaeologists. However, these are all very modern public debates too. Can we tell the youth that by studying the past, they will be looking at the future like into a crystal ball? I would think that's probably true. Uh, as I've worked over the material, it seems to me that the only thing that's changed is the technology and that how people react, how people's goals, people's ambitions, uh, people's good behavior and bad behavior can be paralleled at all times throughout antiquity and certainly into the modern time. So you can know it, but whether you can do anything about it is another matter. It is time to conclude our interview. Many thanks for your time. In closing, would you like to send any open message to the youth about classical studies and to the youth who are about to make their choice to enroll to a university? Sure, uh, maybe slightly different from Europe and America, but from the American point of view, uh, I would advise almost any student who can do it to study antiquity. If you look at some very, very successful men, uh, they majored in Greek or Latin when they were undergraduates, and I don't think your major matters one bit. You learn how to study and you learn how to learn in college. You don't have to learn your discipline or profession there. And uh, it seems to me if I were hiring somebody and for a job and the person people did not have the experience, uh, I would look at somebody who had majored in, let's say, theater arts, and I would look at somebody else with identical papers, except they had majored in classics, I would know that the classics major had an immense amount of discipline to have mastered that field, and that is the sort of person I would want as an employee. Thank you again, Professor Kelly. Yeah, you're welcome.